Okay, we finished up last unit talking about these unbounded areas, these improper integrals, like one over x and one over x squared. And we ended up finding that some of these areas actually converged. They would trend towards a specific value, whereas others, though they appear to be very similar, if not the same, diverged, okay? Example that we showed, and we used our calculator to see, that if you looked at the area from 1 to infinity of 1 over x and 1 to infinity of 1 over x squared, though really very similar the graphs, going ahead and uh, evaluating these integrals using the fundamental theorem of calculus, we end up getting that this is going to trend towards infinity, so it diverges. And then over here, the antiderivative is actually negative 1 over x. Towards infinity, we end up with 0 minus negative 1, which is 1, so that ends up converging. Okay, so we had this concept, this idea, which is weird, but it's very, very important. It's what we're going to actually study in this unit. Whether we can have an infinite summation of terms, are we going to get something that's going to converge towards a value, or will it just continue to increase? I really liked what we did when we <coughs> plugged this into our calculator. We math nined it. Let's go from 1 to, I think we went to 5,000. I'm going to go to 50,000. might be too large. Of 1 over x. We see a value is larger than the value that we looked at the last time we did. And then if I did 1 to 50,000 of 1 over x squared, we end up seeing a number that's going to be very, very close to 1. Okay? And just to confirm that this is not going to converge to a value, I'll add another 0. And we'll see, we'll get a bigger number. It's not going to get closer to 11. Now we're up to 13. Okay? So it just continues to add area, it will never converge towards a number, okay? This unit, we will focus on this concept. It's a kind of shift in this course from derivatives and integrals, infinite sums and instantaneous rates of changes. And we shift towards if we take a summation of these terms that are given to us by a certain expression, will that summation end up Converging or diverging. So this unit is on the series of constants. Now, this is a series. What is a series? It's just the summation of a bunch of terms. I list them as A's, but they can be numbers, like 1 and plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5, or 1 half plus 1, or 1 plus 1 half plus 1 third plus 1 fourth, and stuff like that. We will be using, frequently, summation notation, which we need to be familiar with. I would write this as the sum of a bunch of A's, I denote them as A sub N's, where N is going to start at 1 and go to 5. This is how we write summation notation for this example. The bottom term should provide some connection with what you're dealing with. Okay, if this is a sub n, we should see n here. 
That way, you'd have A1, then A2, then A3. This is telling you what values you are starting with. The 5 tells you what value you're going to, and you will be only counting integers between the two values. So this is saying take the sum, so add up A1, A2, A3, A4, A5, and you get this. These are equal to each other. Okay? Now, if I give you a set of finite terms, they're going to converge for sure. They're going to hit a number, okay? But that's not what we're going to deal with this unit. We're going to look at infinite series, where we'll go from a certain value all the way towards infinity. I don't list it as a sub-infinity, but you'll get the idea. In this situation, we'd be taking the sum of my ANs. I sometimes will start with my zero term instead of my first term. In this situation, I have A0. So I'd say, hey, start with n as being 0 and go to infinity. And that's how you would list, using summation notation, you know, this infinite series. Okay. Well, typically we won't just have A's, we will have actually terms, you know. So example is like this. this is the sum n starting at 1 going to infinity of 1 over 2n, 2, n, two, two, two to the n, not 2n. Okay. It's important to be able to write down what we are adding together. Okay. Now, n is starting from 1. That means my first term will be this with 1 plugged in for n. So I just get 1 half. Then, when n is 2, plug in 2, 1 over 2 squared, 1 fourth. Plug in 3, 1 eighth. Going towards infinity. Okay? Now the question is, is that going to converge? Is that going to diverge? How will we know? And what would it possibly converge to? We'll talk about that more in the future. Right now, just that's how we can list it off. Well, here's one that's a little bit more complicated. We have negative 1 to the n plus 1, and we have n factorial. Let's go ahead and start this from 0. Now, recall what a factorial is. It's just your product of all of your terms, integers, going towards 0. So if you think about it, 2 factorial would just be 2 times 1. 3 factorial would be 3 times 2 times 1, et cetera. 4 factorial, 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. 1 factorial is 1. 0 factorial, we also say, is 1. Okay? 
All right, so let's see. When n is 0, I'd have negative 1 to the 0 plus 1 over 0 factorial, which is 1. This would be negative 1. Plus, I'm using 1 as my first, uh, as my next term for n. This is when n was 0. Now n is 1. I'd have negative 1 to the first over 1 factorial. Sorry, this would be to the 1 plus 1, which is the second. Over 1 factorial, which is 1. This would be positive 1. And then we go to n is 2. Well, it would be negative 1 to the 2 plus 1, which is 3, over 2 factorial. Negative 1 cubed would retain its sign, so we'd actually be subtracting, and it would be 1 over 2 factorial is just 2. Let's do another one. n is equal to 3. It would be negative 1 to the 3 plus 1 over 3 factorial. 3 plus 1 is 4. Negative 1 to the 4th power ends up moving it back to a positive. 3 factorial is 6. So in this series, we are uh, adding all of our terms, but some the terms end up alternating their signs. And we will see whether or not this series is going to converge, and if it does, what it converges to. Two different questions, one being more harder than the other. Okay? We might be asked, given a series, to write it using summation notation. It's good to be able to write it using n is 0 and n is 1. So, given this, can you write the sigma summation notation that gives you that list? Well, it looks like you're just taking your integers and squaring them in a denominator, right? All right, well, how can we list that? It's going to be the sum of 1 over my n value squared, right? Let's see if that works. If I take n and starts at 1 and goes to infinity, will that work? 1 over 1 squared, 1 over 2 squared, 1 over 3 squared. Good, that's my first one. It's also important to be able to understand if you changed n, how you would have to adjust your terms so that you get the same thing. If I started at 0 instead of at 1, what could I do to this so that they're the exact same and produce the same? Go ahead and figure that out. Discuss that with your neighbor. How can you get the 1 plus 1 fourth plus 1 ninth plus 1 sixteenth if you're starting at 0 for n? You should be able to do it if I started at 5 for n. At 10 for n, what can you do so that you can still have this series here? If I tried 1 over n squared, it doesn't work. Because I'd have 1 over 0 squared as my first term. That's not right. All right, figure out the adjustment. Discuss it with your neighbor.
Anybody got it? Seems to be zero discussion. Mr. Darnell, did you get it? Why aren't you discussing it with Mr. Keneally? Well, that's 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 very nice of you, actually. It's good to let other people try to figure it out. Mr. Keneally, did you get it? Maybe. Well, why don't you guys discuss what you think could be right? What is it, Mr. Darnell? Yeah. We can use parentheses and say, hey, we need to start with 1 squared and then 2 squared. Well, take my 0, add 1 to it, and square it. Isn't that easy? And if I change this to 3, to 4, to 5, anything, you can adjust by adding or subtracting. Simple enough, right? Okay, good. All right, you guys do this one. But I want it with n is 0 and n is 1. Some things that might help you, if you're starting with n is 1, you know, you could start listing, okay, this would be my first, second, third, fourth, fifth term. If I started with 0, this would be my 0, first, second, third, fourth term, you know. Maybe you could see the manipulation of those numbers, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, to get these terms. Maybe you see an easier manipulation with 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and you can start with your zeroth term summation. This one, it's easier to start with the whole n is 1 than n is 0. And give it a shot. You also have to worry about those pluses and minuses, too. works. So it would be that, yep, but you got to have the alternating of things. So it needs to go from positives to negatives, the positives to negatives.
So it looks like one has got three to the first, second, third, fourth, and the other one's got two to the zero, one, two, three, four. So it's like, well, which one do I want to use, one or zero? Well, we just have to adjust both of them. Let's say we start at one. Well, this would be three to the n. This would be two to the n, but take away one so that you're starting at zero. Right? If I use my first term, it'd be three over two to the zero. That's one. And then it'd be three squared over two to the first. Good. But I'm missing something. I have positive 3 minus 9 halves plus 27 fourths minus 81 eighths. Now you can assume, okay, well, if I put a negative in here, would that work? Well, I'm starting with my first term, so that'd be negative 3 to the first, so that would make this have to be negative, so that doesn't work. Okay, this is where we have the whole negative one that we can use and manipulate it on the side. I could do negative one to the n minus one or the n plus one. It doesn't really matter because if I plugged in one, one plus one would give me two, negative one squared, positive one, boom, and then it would be an odd power, then an even power, then an odd power, then an even power. So it'd be you know, positive one, then negative one, then positive one, then negative one, as the n's continue to increase. So it doesn't matter for the negative one to the power, but we do need, you know, something in here to make sure that it changes sign, whether it's a plus one or a minus one with the n. Okay, now do it if n starts at zero. Well, I can just do negative 1 to the n because negative 1 to the 0 power is just positive 1. Then negative 1 to the first power would be a negative. So that works out with the positive, then the negative, and the positive, and the negative. That's fine. Well, I need to start with 3 to the first power. So this would be 3 to the n plus 1. And all of a sudden, I'd start with 0 plus 1. That's the first power. I divide it by 2 to the 0 power. Well, that's easy. That's just 2 to the n. And all of a sudden, we have that one. And we can actually write this more ways than this, obviously, depending on where we start. But through manipulation of this, I can rewrite this and actually find that we have a common ratio. And we can change things up a little bit if we want to. Uh, we will do that in, uh, later in this lesson. Okay? So we now know how to take a series, write it in summation notation. We know if we have summation notation, how we can write stuff out. Here's the question. How are we going to know if a series is going to converge or diverge? Okay? Series is going to converge if the sum will end up equaling a constant. The series will diverge if the sum does not equal a constant. Well, how do I know when it equals a constant or when it doesn't equal a constant? Don't worry, we have an entire unit of different techniques and ways to handle uh, these series to see whether they converge or diverge. Now, I don't even put infinity down here because we will find that that's not necessarily the case for diverging series. OK. 
Okay, it just can't equal one term. It's not trending towards a term as we continue to add them up. Now, probably the easiest thing to start with is to know that a series is not going to converge. It's definitely going to diverge. Okay, so let's figure out an easy way to tell if a series diverges. I will show you a couple series that will diverge. Let's start with these two. <coughs> the sum from 1 to infinity, starting from 1 going to infinity of just n. So 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 plus 6 plus 7. Is that going to converge to a value? Heck no. We're adding a, a larger value each time. We are going to be adding larger and larger values. So definitely diverges, right? This one diverges. How can we tell that that's going to diverge? The top is going faster than the bottom. So that means what? Yeah, the values here are ending up larger over time. We are adding a larger value. Let's look at something maybe like this. The values are getting larger, but let's say they weren't getting larger. I don't like this one. What if I just have some sum of some ANs and we have 1 plus um, no, no, let's start 2 plus 1 point yeah, whatever. I don't love it. Go back to the last one. Yeah, if the values are getting larger, we obviously know that this is going to trend towards infinity. We're adding something that's a value, a value. We're adding something that's larger than 1 to a previous one. If I continue to add 1, if I just continue to add 1 plus 1 plus 1, I'm going to trend towards infinity. Well, these terms are adding 1 plus a little bit more each time. So, yeah, we're definitely going to trend towards infinity. In the end, the key is if the limit as n approaches infinity of my general term does not approach zero, if I'm not adding smaller and smaller values, I'm adding larger and larger values. then my series will definitely diverge. Okay? We need to have a certain situation like, you know, 1 over x or 1 over x squared where I'm adding consistently smaller and smaller values that are trending towards zero. And the question is, are they going to be small enough so that I'm not adding enough for that to increase in value? It'll just approach a certain value. 1 over x squared, we took this infinite sum of all these values and it approached 1, which is the area. However, 1 over x did not approach anything, just approaches infinity, okay? If I looked at these ones here, the limit as n approaches infinity of 3n over 2n plus 1, what does that equal?
Remember, we can not worry about the 1 because I'm plugging in infinities. It's just 3n over 2n. And what does that equal? 3 halves. So as I'm going often towards infinity, if I'm adding larger and larger of the n values, the nth terms, I'm literally going to be adding 3 halves every time as I trend towards infinity. Well, if I continue to add 1 and a half, we're not going to get to a specific number. Okay? This is trending towards infinity, so obviously we are going to diverge. Even if I had something like one over, uh, I don't want to say that. Yeah. So diverge. Now, we would say, okay, great. So if my limit does not approach zero, then my sum is going to diverge. Well, that means if my limit does approach zero, you would think that all of my series would converge. But that's not the case. We can say all converging series the limit as n approaches infinity will equal zero. However, not all series where the limit of a and n will equal zero will converge. It works one way but not the other. Now, we can talk about partial sums. Partial sums are just the kind of step-by-step -step sums of my series. It will be one way that we can help determine if our series is going to converge or not when my terms trend towards zero. Okay, so let's look at this series. It's 1 over 2 to the n, 1 half plus 1 fourth plus 1 eighth, so starting at 1. First, immediately, I look at the limit as n approaches infinity of 1 over 2 to the n, and I know that this is going to approach 0. So I say 1 over 2 to the n, the sum may converge. I don't know if it does or not, but I know it definitely does not diverge. Well, I can start listing off what these partial sums are going to be. Now, I denote them as S sub whatever, so whatever our n value is, which means the first partial sum, what is the sum of just my first term? I end up with 1 half. S sub 2 would be my second partial sum, which would be just the sum of my first two terms. Now uh, that is uh, 2 fourths plus 1 fourth, which is 3 fourths. I can do my third partial sum, which is the sum of my first three terms, 1 half plus 1 fourth plus 1 eighth. This is 3 fourths plus 1 eighth, so that's 6 fourths plus 1 eighth, which is, uh, I mean, sorry, 6 eighths plus 1 eighth, which is 7 eighths. Let's go off to our fourth partial sum. This would be 7 eighths plus 1 sixteenth, so that's 14 sixteenths plus 1 sixteenth, which is 15 sixteenths.
Well, if I looked at my fifth partial sum, and I could start doing this stuff with the calculator, if I add 1 32nd to 1 16th, and all of a sudden I see that all of the sums that I'm looking at, they keep getting closer and closer to a specific value, right? What are they getting closer and closer to? Getting closer and closer to 1. If they are not passing 1, if we see that looking towards infinity, we are going to get closer and closer to 1, boom. We just discovered that my series is going to converge, and it's going to converge to 1. I can say S sub n, and I can write this as an expression. So this is 2 to the n in the denominator, and in the numerator it ends up being 2 to the n minus 1. So if you think about it, first term would be 2 minus 1, that's 1 over 2. Second term, second partial sum would be 4 minus 1 is 3 over 4. Okay, this would be the nth partial sum. Well, if this is going to converge to a value, the series will converge, and we will be able to find what it converges to. Okay? So if a sequence of partial sums converge, then the series will converge, and the limit of the sequence of partial sums will equal the sum that we're looking at. Let me give an example of that. A series, a sub n, has an nth partial sum, s sub n, which is equal to 2n over 5n plus 2. What is the sum of the series? Discuss that with your neighbor. What'd you get, Mr. Quigley? Um, what do you think? Yep, that would be it. Okay. If these are all the partial sums listed by this, you know, uh, this expression, if I plug in infinity, I would get, you know, the partial sum at infinity, which would be the summation of the series, which, if it ends up being a number, tells me it's converging, and it's converging to this specific limit. So I'll say the sum, the summation, the series, is going to equal the limit as n approaches infinity, as s of n, which is the limit, n approaches infinity, of 2n over 5n plus 2, which equals two fifths. So we converge and we converge to two fifths. <coughs> Fantastic. Okay. The whole process of looking at partial sums is something that we can do if we had a calculator and we can just continuously add the next term and add the next term and add the next term and see are we going to be approaching a value or are we just going up when we continue to add. Okay, that's not realistic in this class. We need to be able to find quickly whether or not a series, depending on its characteristics, will converge or diverge. So we will kind of portion this off, not into looking at series as a whole, but looking at specific types of series and whether or not they converge and what characteristics that they have to converge or diverge. The first specific type of series we will look at is a geometric series. A geometric series is denoted by its common ratio and its first term.
Common ratio would be the R, the value that is being taken to the nth power. Typically, n starts at zero, which would mean a would be the first term. But it won't always start at zero, and I'll show you a way around it. Okay. Here are examples of geometric series. This would be three plus two plus three times four over nine which would be 12 ninths, plus 3 times 8 over 27, et cetera, et cetera. Here's another geometric series where it's just 4 thirds to the n. So this would be 4 thirds plus 16 ninths plus, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, geometric series are very easy to deal with. A geometric series will converge if the R value that's being taken to the nth power is between zero and one. And it's not just positive R values between 0 and 1. It also will be positive and negative values between 0 and 1. And this is one of the only series that we can do this. Not only can we tell based on A and R, whether our series will converge, we can figure out what the summation would be, what it would converge to. And this series, geometric series, would equal my first term of my series, A1, which could be A0. I'll just denote it as A1 or A1. How about that? over 1 minus r. The proof of why this is true is in your book, but it's easy enough to remember. If you have a geometric series, this would be the sum. Okay. Now, typical questions were, hey, here's a geometric series. Does it converge? or diverge, and if it converges, what's the sum? Let's look at this first one, this 3 times 2 thirds to the n. So if you list it off, you can say it's 3 plus 3 times 2 thirds plus 3 times 4 ninths. Sure, that's just to know that it's a geometric series. We know that it is going to approach 0 as n trends to infinity, so we know that it could converge. But now, specifically, I know it's in the form of a geometric series. I know that 2 thirds is between 0 and 1. So that means I know it converges. Since I know it converges, I can find the sum because it's a geometric series. Now, my first term is 3. My common ratio, two-thirds, and this would what it would converge to. One minus two-thirds is one-third. Three divided by one-third is nine. My second one, four-thirds to the n. I know that this is larger than one. So I immediately know it diverges. It also fails the whole limits n test for divergence. The limit as n approaches infinity of 4 thirds to the n does not equal 0. So you immediately can say diverges as well.
Okay. Some other series that we can look at. We might not see as being in this form of a times r to the n, but we can rewrite it so that it is in that form. Example of this, the sum n is starting from 2 here to infinity of 1 over 2n. I can rewrite this as 1 over 2 to the n. It's not going to change what I have. 1 to the n will always be 1. So all of a sudden, it's rewritten in the form of a geometric series. So r is between 0 and 1. So I know it converges. My first term would be 1 fourth. My second term would be when n is 3, that'd be 1 eighth. My first term, 1 fourth, would be divided by 1 minus a half to give me my sum. So that's positive 1 half divided by 1 fourth. One Fourth divided by one half is the same as one half. Okay, let's look at this guy. This does not appear to be a geometric series. It's written as just like a series with different powers of n. But we need to recall some exponent properties. If I have x to the 2 plus 3, I know I can write that as x squared times x cubed. Right? Well, I can rewrite this as e to the n times e to the first in the numerator. Denominator stays as pi to the n. And all of a sudden, I can rewrite this as the sum, n starting from 1 going to infinity, of e times e over pi to the n. And I now have a geometric series. Will this series converge or diverge, Mr. Ramanetti? Diverge, why do you say that? Well, if I took this towards infinity, the question is, is it going to approach infinity or approach zero? Or is it going to approach something other than zero? That's the key. And really, all we have to look at is this R, right, Mr. Ramanetti? Is it less than 1 and greater than 0? E over pi. It's less than 1. So it's a geometric series, r is less than 1, it's convergent. I'm calling on people if they're using their phone in class. Now, what is going to be the sum? Well, the first term would be e times e over pi, because I'm starting with n as 1. So this would converge to e squared over pi over 1 minus e over pi. I'm not even going to do that math. I'm just going to say that's what the sum is. Okay, your turn. Figure out if these series converge or diverge. If they converge, find the sum.
seven fifths, one fifth divided by seven fifths, one seventh. Right, so the absolute value of R has to be between 0 and 1. So even if it has a negative value, it's still good. Okay, as long as it's between 0 and 1. Actually, another way we'll be able to tell that that is definitely going to converge with it being negative. Uh, the other one's not nice. If I changed it to zero, it'd be okay. If I changed it to zero. I rewrite it as 5 to the n times 5 to the negative first over 6 to the n times 6. I now can rewrite it as 5 over 6 to the n times 1 over 30. This is between 0 and 1, the absolute value of it. So I know that we are going to converge. My first term, if n is 0, is 1 30th. So the sum is 1 30th, 1 minus 5 6. And you can do the math. 6 6 minus 5 6 is 1 6. 1 6 divided into 1 30th would be five, uh, 6 over 30th or 1 over 5. Okay, we also need to be prepared for having certain series with unknowns. Uh, here's another one, different question. Consider the series where the first term is 5, a to the n plus 1 divided by a to the n is 1 third. Find the sum. This statement right here is just showing you what r is. This would be the common ratio. It's what the next term divided by the previous term is. That will be how you find r. So if you want to find this sum, it would just be that. Another type of question. You could be given a series like this, and you'd be asked to find the sum of the series. In this situation, you'd have to find that R. What would be R in this situation? Is part R. Yeah, it'd be one half. It'd actually be negative one half. You can multiply each of these terms by negative one half and you'd get the next term. So boom, we have found R. Our first term is 36. Our sum would be 36 over one minus negative a half. That's 12 times two is 24. Okay? Even though these terms are going on forever and ever and ever, they would converge to 24. Finally, we have certain situations where I have an x, and I'm asking you to find the x value such that the series converges. Very, very important to understand that just your inside of what you're taking uh, to the power needs to be between 0 and 1, but its absolute value needs to be between 0 and 1. Typically, you don't have to worry about the whole between 0 and 1, just making sure that your values do not equal 0 is good. Now, how do I handle this? Thankfully, we can multiply both sides by 4, and I'd have the absolute values of my x's have to be less than 4. Well, 
to deal with an absolute value with an inequality, we have to understand that x's could be positive or negative. So we'd say, okay, our positive x's have to be less than 4, but my negative x's also have to be less than 4. This will give you that my x's will have to be greater than negative 4 by dividing both sides by negative 1 and understanding that when we divide by a negative over an inequality, we flip. So we end up getting this range that my x's can be between 4 and negative 4, which is good so long as x does not equal 0 because we can't have a sum with 0 in it uh, and that be, in this situation, it would be fine, but it would be a sum of just a bunch of 1's. That would not be good. No, it would be a sum of zeros. That would also work. But sorry about that. So that's fine. Okay, I'm going to show you the rest of the examples for your video if you want to watch. Homework's out of your book. It's just manipulation, geometric series, and term tests for divergence. Yes. Yep. All right, next one, negative x over 2 to the n. Well, in this case, the absolute value of negative x over 2 needs to be less than 1. Greater than 0, let's not worry about that right now. If I have 0 in this case, if there's a value in front of it and this would be 0 uh, to the n, it would be concerning. I'm not going to worry about it too much. Anyways, so we'd have negative x has to be less than 2. I multiply both sides by 2. I can do that. Well, this ends up being just positive x has to be less than 2 because of the absolute value. Um, so positive x would have to be less than 2, and negative x would have to be less than 2. That would be x has to be greater than negative 2. So we'd have to be between negative 2 and 2. Should make sense. We just need to make sure we have a fraction, something less than one, in our series. So those are some easy ones, some more difficult ones, these last couple. Here we have this series. It does not appear to be a geometric series, but I can rewrite it to be x minus 3 over 2 to the n, a property of exponent we can use. And in this situation, we'd have x minus 3 over 2, absolute value. That has to be less than 1. Multiply everything by 2. Get x minus 3, absolute value, has to be less than 2. Now, again, how do I treat this? I have x minus 3 would be less than 2, so the positive x minus 3s, but also the negative x minus 3s would have to be less than 2. This one gives me x has to be less than 5. The other one would give me that x minus 3 would be greater than negative 2. Add 3, x would be greater than 1. So we'd have these values between 1 and 5, which would work. Last one, what can we do here? Rewrite it. This is x minus 4 to the n. This is 5 to the n times 5. So this ends up being x minus 4 to the over 5 to the n times 1 over 5. I need to make sure this is less than 1. Absolute value of x minus 4 over 5 has to be less than 1. We multiply both sides by 5. We can do that with absolute values. Giving me absolute x minus 4 is less than 1. So that means the positive x minus 4s have to be less than 1, and the negative x minus 4s have to be less than 1. You can kind of just figure out that it's going to be 5 and 3 that you have to be between. If you can't figure that out, though, this works. x is less than 5. Here, x minus 4s would have to be greater than negative 1. Add 4, x has to be greater than 3. Okay, so you can kind of see between 3 and 5. Boom, 5 minus 4, 3 minus 4 gives you those 1s. Okay, and this gives you your x values, which would ensure that the geometric series is convergent. All right, that's day one.